Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to our first ever Data Bytes event, Getting Things Done with Data in Government, kindly supported by Vocalink, a MasterCard company. I'm Gavin Freegard, Head of Data and Transparency and Programme Director here at the Institute for Government, and thrilled to see so many of you here for what's a bit of a departure for us, a slightly different event. And it's good to see so many of you looking very excited, looking very relieved. It's almost as if you're trying to escape from something that's going on <laughs> in the real world at the moment. Um, before I tell you what the format is and um, why we're doing what we're doing, a bit of housekeeping first. Um, so the housekeeping is as follows. We are on the record tonight. Um, we are also being live streamed, so hello to you if you're watching around the country, and I know lots of people are. Um, you'll also be able to watch this and listen to this um, after the event as well. If you would like to join in on Twitter, um, the hashtag is IFGDataBytes, and you can also follow at IFG Events. And if you want to get on the Wi-Fi while you're in the room, um, the network is IFG Guest, the username is IFG, and the password is Visitor. So welcome to this very different sort of event uh, tonight. You might be used to lots of panel discussions here at the Institute or various presentations. We're doing something completely different this evening. You're going to be watching and listening to four presentations on data projects that do or could do interesting things with government data. Each speaker, each presentation, will have eight minutes and eight minutes only to present. That's why there is a timer over there, which may or may not fail us at some point during the evening, but we will see. Um, the eight minutes is based on a typically nerdy Institute for Government joke. The basic unit of uh, information or data is a byte. There are eight bits in a byte, hence there are eight minutes in a data byte. <laughs> Just be pleased that we didn't go for data megabytes. We'd still be here in 2034. Um, once we've got through the first eight minutes, each speaker will take eight minutes of questions from you, the audience. Please do just give us your name, where you're from, and a one-line question, because I will start timing those eight minutes as soon as the first question is started. So we'll have eight minutes from a speaker, eight minutes from you for questions, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So since this is the first of what we hope will become a series, why do we care about data here at the Institute for Government? Well, we think better use of data matters for effectiveness, because government needs to use data to understand how it's operating. It also needs to use data effectively to fuel public services, uh, inform its policies, and so on and so forth. But also for accountability, and this is particularly open data, allowing parliament, the press, and the public to hold government to account. Now, we do lots of stuff with data here at the Institute. Most of that work to date has focused on visualizing data, uh, showing you the size, this is what's happened to the civil service in terms of staff numbers since about 2010. The shape, these are the grade structures of different civil service departments, lots more on our website. And also the performance of central government, probably best to gloss over the appalling satisfaction ratings that you can see on that particular chart. Um, and as well as Whitehall Monitor, we've applied a similar um, sort of technique to public services in our performance tracker project to Parliament in our Parliamentary Monitor project, and lots of other things that we do as well, most recently on government procurement and the Brexit effect, look at the impact of Brexit on Whitehall. Of course, most recently, we've mainly been counting votes <laughs> and also ministerial resignations. This chart is showing you... <laughs> You won't see nothing yet. This chart is showing you the resignations outside of reshuffles under prime ministers from Thatcher to Cameron. And you can see you know, Blair gets close to 30, Thatcher gets close to 25. Let's add May into this chart, shall we? <laughs> I've had to update this twice today. You will see the timestamp in the corner. We are not expecting this will be the final version. Um, but as well as just uh, taking lots of data and visualizing it, we want to do more than that. Um, and, uh, uh, towards the end of last year, we published a report which looked at some gaps in government data, things that government should be publishing or publishing better um, to try to inform the public. Of course, it's not just about publishing more things, it's about publishing things in a different way, using, accessing and analysing data in a different way. I think one of the problems that we found was that when we talk about data, we're talking about so many different things. Everything from official statistics to the evidence in policy making to the personal data that can go into public services. And it means that across government there's quite a fractured data landscape. Uh, last year with our friends at Full Fact, we tried to brainstorm all of the organisations we thought had some part in the government data ecosystem. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of them. 
So, and if you look at the link down there, you can go to a Google Sheet and add any ones that we've forgotten, because I'm sure there are plenty. So one of the reasons that we wanted to do this event series was to bring together the different data communities across government. But we also wanted to show leaders who perhaps listen to the word data and switch off a little bit um, what better data actually means in practice. And one of the ways of doing that is, of course, to put best practice and interesting projects on the record. And we have a fantastic lineup, a veritable smorgasbord for you to feast on tonight at our very first Data Bytes. First of all, our first eight minute presentation will be from Louisa Nolan from the ONS Data Science Campus. She'll be talking about faster indicators of economic activity. Then you'll get eight minutes of questions, and then we'll be on to Paul Maltby, the Chief Digital Officer at Mahoka Logo, as I insist we try to make it stick, uh, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, talking about digital land. We'll then be hearing from our very kind sponsors from the, for this evening, David Divitt, the Vice President of Financial Crime Product Management at Vocalink, a MasterCard company. And I've seen the slides and I'm intrigued about what, how we can use data to uncover sophisticated financial crime. And then we will move on to our final presentation of the evening from Sophie Adams and John Downing, who will be talking about data analytics at the Office of Gas and Electricity Markets, Ofgem. So, uh, we are hoping to turn this into a series. You can put this date in your diary now. Our next data bite will be on the evening of Wednesday, the 1st of May, 2019. If you do a, an interesting project, and that could be building something, it could be a culture-related project, it could be something to do with ethics, all sorts of things are covered by project. And if you're doing something with government data and you want to pitch a presentation, do please email me. I'm on gavin.freeguard at instituteforgovernment.org.uk. And as I said, we would like to continue uh, this series. So if you're interested in funding a future Data Bytes event, you can get in touch with our head of partnerships, who conveniently has the longest email in the entire organization. Uh, that's david.trepepi-lewis at instituteforgovernment.org.uk. Um, so yes, thank you once again very much for coming. Um, I'm going to, in a very analog fashion, reset our timer. Uh, to eight minutes, and then we will have our first ever data bite <coughs> from Louisa Nolan from the ONS. Thank you very much. Louisa. We'll get there in the end. I need more than three seconds. <laughs> As you can see, Professor Sir Charles Bean in 2016 in the um, Independent Review of Economic Statistics said, the longer a decision maker has to wait for the statistics, the less useful they're likely to be. And he's thinking about decision makers like the Monetary Policy Committee, who are making decisions that affect the economy and jobs and therefore people's well-being. And there's been a challenge more widely to national statistics institutes to make use of big data and to make use of the tools of data science to provide basically more information more quickly. So this talk really is about the data science campus's response to this challenge and what we've done so far in our faster indicators of UK economic activity project. A set of objectives, always best to know what you want to do before you start doing it. So the first thing was to think about what data sets we could access that were real time, so they were fast, faster than the <coughs> official statistics, but that had some kind of real relationship to, um, to the economy. So in the past, there's been things like people have looked at the lipstick indicator, which is now discredited and was started by, um, I think it was the CEO of Estee Lauder. Coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and one which I always find very amusing about men's underwear, apparently it stays the same unless the economy goes down, and then if men's underwear goes down, we're in trouble. So we wanted to find, that is my best joke. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Um, so we wanted to find some data that had some kind of real economic um, relationships. 
Our key goal was not to predict GDP, so that's not what we're out to do, but to find things that might tell us something. Maybe there was a large change in the economy, so it would be an indicator, an early warning system, a canary in a mine, if you like, you can see some big change that requires some kind of further investigation, might give some insight into what is going on. So then also about insights, so different aspects of the economy, perhaps we can look at regional aspects, something that tells you more than a headline figure. And then the last one was now casting. We haven't done this yet, but we've made the data available for other people to put this into their now casting models. So although we haven't done any prediction or now casting of GDP, the data is being made available for other people to do this. Because we know there's lots of people out there with models. So what did we use? So the first thing we looked at was the HMRC value-added tax returns. Uh, obviously this is tax and uh, turnover and expenditure for all VAT registered companies in the UK. Massive data set, really interesting. It's already in GDP in the official estimates, but what could we do that was a bit faster? And what we did was create some diffusion index from it. So diffusion index is really simple. You just take your two periods, count up everything in that period, count the number that have gone up in turnover expenditure and divide one by the other. It's that simple. But we also did something a bit more innovative as well. So we were looking at reporting behaviour because in a time of economic stress or financial stress, you might expect the way people but to behave to change. So we looked at things like did repayments change, uh, were there more re-inputs and things like that. We also looked at shipping. Shipping, you would hope, would be related to trade, trading goods anyway, stuff coming in and out. And this is a heat map of Felixstowe over Christmas. You can see on the 25th of December, not much going on, but just before, it's quite busy. And then the third data set we have is um, from Highways England, uh, road traffic counts, and you can see all the census here, and we can do counts for all England, but also look around ports, and then potentially link that up with the shipping. So we expect the traffic indicators to be related to things like trade, movement of goods <coughs> around the country, um, perhaps for this also looking at commuting and um, jobs, and HMRC is very definitely a key economic indicator. So we've ticked our first box, our first objective. So what did we find? So our second obje objective was, can we find things where we can see where something might have changed a lot in the economy? So this up here, scatter plot, I'm sorry, but it does show something interesting. So we've got the diffusion index, the value of the diffusion index. Um, higher means more companies have their turnover going up, lower means more have going, fewer have them going up. And then across the x-axis, we've got GDP. So what you see here is we've hit our second objective. Mostly, in the red bit, where the recession happened, you see the diffusion index is really low. So if you see a low diffusion index, probably you need to start thinking about what you want to do. But, really important point, not so good um, correlation when things are more stable. So you see a lot of scatter up here. So although it's useful for detecting the big changes, care needs to be taken in interpreting some of these um, because it doesn't really get, you know, is it 0.2 or 0.3% growth. But we would have seen at the time, five months ahead of the official statistics, <coughs> the first quarter of the downturn in the economy in 2008. Now, again, caveats, because it's all about the caveats, because it's real data. Um, <laughs> Obviously, GDP has changed, we've made improvements to GDP, and even the publication schedule has changed, and what happens in one recession may not be the same in the next recession, but still, we would have seen the last recession five months early, so we have ticked the box for that one. For shipping, we, did, we created two indicators, one was time in port, and one was the shipping traffic in the port. This is for port traffic, and what this shows is it has a really quite good correlation with imports of goods. So basically, if your port traffic is low, you've got lower imports, and if it's high, you've got higher imports. Again, lots of scatter, don't make place too much weight on a single point, but it's a useful thing. We've also split this up by ports around the UK, so you can look at individual ports, relate them back to the kind of goods that are coming in and out of those ports, and see <coughs> if there is something going on, how that relates to the overall economy. And then the third one, Road traffic for all England. We're trying to get hold of more data for Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So we've got, uh, which way around? Imports and exports, official statistics. And then here we've got large vehicles. So this is things like uh, HGVs. And what you see is that you do see the recession here. 
some stuff going on here. Some of this is about the data quality. There's always a trade-off between time and quality. Um, but you see here there was a bit of a dip in uh, freight on roads around here. So that's good. And we can make these available between uh, a month to, for VAT, between a month and a few days before the official statistics, so it's earlier. Uh, for this, we're doing monthly at the moment, so it's available a month before the official GDP statistics, um, but we could make that faster possibly, and this is two months ahead of, uh, sorry, at the same time as this, as GDP. But it gives you a bit more granular detail, and the idea is, if you see something going on there, you would then go and investigate further and um, understand not just what the impact might be on GDP, but what's actually going on in the economy. Excellent. Perfect timing. Oh, no. Almost perfect timing. So we've already published data, uh, methodology, and some economic commentary on March the 18th. If you go to the Data Science Campus website, you can find that. Our first timely, eagerly anticipated timely updates on April the 15th, um, which will show data up to the end of February. And it's work in progress. This is just this in development. There are going to be research outputs. There's a lot more that we can do, so we really welcome people coming back with suggestions about how to improve it. Oh, five seconds. Five seconds. Five seconds. <laughs> well, what a brilliant way to start the series. Thank you very much indeed, Louisa. Um, once I have reset this incredibly high-tech <laughs> timing device... I'd like to say I practice that to be exact. But it's not true. <laughs> um, we're now going to take a few questions. Um, as I said, if you could keep them incredibly short, just give us your name, where you're from, and we'll try to take three and uh, see how we get on with. And I'm going to start the timer as soon as we ask the first question. So if you'd like to ask a question, please put your hand up now. So we've got one at the back, the gentleman there. We've got the gentleman at the front. Can we have a third question, preferably a woman? Have a bit of gender balance? OK, well, let's, um, and yes, the lady there as well. So um, if we start, the, there are mics coming around to you. So we'll start at the back, and we'll come to you, and then we'll come to Paul down at the front. So whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you. Uh, Oliver Marsh, Cabinet Office. Um, those were really creative and interesting lateral measures. How do you come to those? What process do you get so creative? Thank you. Next. And kind of following on nicely with that, um, are there any other indicators that you're looking to develop in the pipeline? And our third question. Hello. Uh, you said something very intriguing, which was uh, there's a trade-off between the timeliness of data and its quality. I wonder if you could dig into that a bit. Brilliant. Excellent. So I'm really glad, glad you asked me about the creativity. Um, Data Science Campus was opened in uh, the Office <coughs> of National Statistics two years ago, almost exactly, and if you want to know all the other interesting stuff we've been up to, we've just published our annual report, which covers two years. Um, so basically, this was created to do innovation and to look at big data and data science techniques. We recruited in a pile of very talented and skilled data scientists, and we're put slightly separate from the rest of ONS. People don't really appreciate it when you kind of experiment on GDP. They kind of like to know what's happening. <laughs> so we have a bit more freedom to innovate um, and to try new stuff. And that's how this has come out and all the other good stuff that we've done as well. Your question was about other indicators. So as well as making some improvements to this, we're really open to other suggestions. Um, so these are just suggestions and not actually things we're working on yet. One might be to look at whether we could use online adverts um, to look at uh, jobs and skills. I think there's been some suggestion that maybe we could look at energy data as well. There's all kinds of things we can do. Obviously, usually the biggest barrier is getting hold of the data. And then timeliness and quality. So obviously, if you're publishing official statistics, the official record, um, for economic statistics, it has to be consistent conceptually with the European System of Accounts 2010, which means <laughs> you have to uh, make sure that the data you're collecting matches those concepts. Um, you need to do... They're all kind of interlinked, so there's a whole pile of stuff around balancing statistics, QA, making the production robust, and making them uh, to be the thing that people expect. 
Whereas these are, let's take some data and see what it shows us. So if you were going to turn this into an official statistic, you'd have to do a whole pile of other steps, looking at concepts and production and all those kinds of things. And you know, if you think about surveys, you could never do it this quickly, because you've got to go out, collect the data, check the data, validate the data, clean it. Uh, do we have any more questions for Louisa? We have time. We have lots of time. Uh, the gentleman at the back, any more? We, again, again, we'll try to take them in a group. And uh, the gentleman in the corner as well. Uh, I'm Chris Fairless at the Greater London Authority. Uh, a question about the robustness of what you were presenting there. What if, hypothetically, there were some sort of step change in, say, tariffs at the ports or freight <laughs> into the <laughs> So this, this and, is... And um, should we oh, sorry. take the next question as well quickly? Hi, uh, Matt Cullough from the Cabinet Office. Um, you said about the, the port stuff, and you talked about how you could disaggregate it to individual ports and link that through to sort of obviously what their main trade things are. But I wondered if also, have you noticed whether certain ports are more robust in the, uh, sort of... Is there a better correlation for certain ports with certain bits of GDP or GDP overall? Um, and... So the interesting thing when you're using third-party data is you have no control over what's collected. So that's something else about quality and timeliness as well. You would hope that if something radical changes, as you could imagine being possible, that it might be reflected. So if it changed and there was no impact on shipping, that would be a really interesting thing to know. And if there was an impact, you would know it a bit sooner than collecting the official statistics on trading goods. But it remains to be seen. This is, this is new. We've had, well, actually, for the shipping data, the data doesn't go back as far as the last recession. But we've only got one recession to look at. Not that I'm assuming that that would be what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know what the impact will be of, of future um, economic climate. But this would hopefully give you some kind of early warning of what was actually going on in, in, the, in real terms in a bit faster than the official statistics. Um, I've completely forgotten what the other question was. <laughs> uh, different ports. Anyhow. Different ports. So we've published data for the top, the biggest ten ports in, um, in the UK, and then we've added three more that the devolved administration has asked for as well. Um, you can... We haven't done uh, a comparison for each of the ports. <coughs> I mean, broadly, you can see that some ports have more traffic than others, so you'd expect them to contribute more. But I think where it becomes an interesting new insight is linking it back to what's coming in and out of those ports, and then you can see what the impact would be on those parts of the economy. We've got this out very quickly. We started work on this less than four months ago. So faster indicators, faster. Um, and we wanted to make the data available as quickly as possible so that if people have questions like that, they can experiment for themselves as well. Excellent. Uh, we have two more minutes. Does anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I will close with a final question. Yes, the lady there. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, I'm um, Emily from the Centre for Aging Better. Um, is, anyone, is anyone using it yet in government? Uh, we've had really good feedback from the key stakeholders who you'd expect to be using this. I can't <coughs> tell you for certain who's actually using it for what, but there's been a lot of interest in having these faster indicators from people who are interested in the economy. Any other final questions? Uh, gentleman there. One of the things you're looking at here is very much the, if you like, the day job, the and there's some other ways you can do it better. Um, one of the things that government struggles with is joined up analysis. Are you looking at any things to do with joined up? You know, what's the best way of avoiding I know, teenage pregnancies? Is it healthcare? Is it education? Is it, well, I won't keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think what sort of what a project is that we're doing. We have, so at the campus, we don't just look at supporting ONS statistics. Um, actually, it's a really good opportunity to tell you this. So we're, we're here to support across government. Um, we, take, we do capability building, but we also take projects from across government and the public sector. So if anybody has some interesting data science that they'd like us to have a look at, we'd be really pleased for them to get in touch. And that kind of thing would be really interesting. 
Excellent. Final 44 seconds. Um, fine, very final question for me. What have been the biggest barriers that you found to doing what you've been doing? I don't think that anyone in this room will be surprised that even for ONS, data access is always difficult. <laughs> and I think, I mean, there's some real things about that. We, we care a lot, um, both legally and professionally, about ethics and privacy and security. And so sometimes you just can't speed those things up. Um, so that's, that's been interesting. I think having the campus and having that pool of like a critical mass of skills has really meant that we've been able to accelerate some of the more innovative work. So that's fixed one of the problems that we had before. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Louisa. <laughs> Next up, we have Paul Maltby, the Chief Digital Officer at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Paul, take the stage. Thank you very much. Um, here's a click. Right, so uh, thanks everyone. So as Chief Digital Officer, I get to look after the digital systems and uh, give uh, uh, my colleagues uh, laptops that work finally. Uh, but also uh, my job of uh, being Chief Digital Officer in a big policy department is helping that department deliver in an internet age. And some of what I'm talking about is how you, you, you broaden the skill set for in, uh, digital capability into a policy uh, world. And on here, right, sorry, back on. That's four seconds you noted that, right? Uh, <laughs> and what I want to talk today about is the work we've been doing on uh, housing, planning, uh, and land data um, in support of, I guess, the, the government's sort of main domestic policy priority of housing, getting more homes to be built. And in this, we're interested in data uh, for lots of reasons, to make good policy, to think about how we uh, effectively uh, prioritise and build uh, infrastructure. But we're really interested in the external users of this data in, in what we've sort of roughly been calling a sort of prop tech uh, uh, emerging sector. So people are building digital services to try and shake up, I suppose, uh, uh, an industry that hasn't always been at the forefront of a sort of digital uh, revolution. Now, in doing this, there's, there's lots of sort of positives. So the good news is there's lots of data. We don't have to go and create data. There's data sort of gathering dust on civil servants' machines and local authority officials' machines. Uh, so you know, there's lots of potential data uh, available. How hard can it be? Um, the other side, from the prop tech side, is it seems to be there's plenty of opportunity to disrupt markets and for people to make money. So in a way, the, there's, a, there's a sort of demand that you would expect to, to flow through this, which is sometimes an important element of uh, making these systems work. Not that that's the only reason we're interested. Um, but it won't surprise you. There's some issues and some issues around the data. So talking particularly to the external users, though in many ways reaffirming stuff that we knew internally, we knew that the, the, the data uh, around housing, land and plannings, uh, it's really hard to, to, to find. When you find it, it's hard to use it and hard to trust it. Um, we found particularly the, the systems geared up for people being interested in data on a sort of one-to-one, human-to-human -to -human level. So as soon as you try to ask for data in bulk, there's lots of quite confusing processes, even for civil servants to get through, never mind for people less familiar with the system, particularly from local authorities, uh, actually. Uh, we also know there's a, um, an issue with uh, uh, licenses uh, for sort of fundamental mapping and for some of the identifiers, stuff that our colleagues and we are trying to work through in government, but this is particularly affecting for, um, for people looking at planning data or housing data, uh, which is obviously geospatial in, in nature, and that is an issue, and it's a real blocker for some of this work to come forwards. And whilst there have always issues with data quality, sometimes it's not quite as you expect. So this is uh, even in an area like um, uh, the Brownfields Register where uh, my department has spent time and effort trying to create a good data standard. Uh, you know, some of the Brownfields pretty blue. Uh, <laughs> and that's not for that particular authority, I should say. That's just a, it's a generic for, the, for that system. So what have we been doing? Um, uh, We've, uh, so we set up a digital land services team, so my colleague Paul Downey in the corner here uh, uh, leads that. And what we've been thinking about is, is trying to help uh, policy colleagues who often think about sort of services, you know, like we're interested in a service for helping you buy and sell homes or something like that. But actually those services themselves are reliant on uh, the fundamental blocks of data and people usually pay less attention to that. So quite a lot of our work is really focused on this sort of more fundamental layer of getting the, 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 the core data in a fit state so that it can be exposed to third-party users for uh, journalists and campaigners and for uh, uh, prop tech people, but also it can feed services internally. Um, we started off looking at things like the Brownfield uh, sites um, 
uh, register. And we, we thought that actually, um, perhaps optimistically, that things would be pretty all right. You know, we might need to do some tweaking. We built a sort of data validator. So the aim was to try and help local authorities go, well, actually, maybe there's a few errors in the data. Uh, this will help show you how compliant with the standard you are, where you can fix it. Um, in practice, um, we found the data was pretty, uh, pretty poor. Uh, fewer than 20% were compliant with the standard, and we realized that there was a more fundamental problem here with the standard itself. It was quite complex. People weren't really applying it, didn't fill it into the, uh, the local authority's core uh, work. Uh, for a second project we, we worked on with our colleagues who do uh, developer contributions, which is like Section 106 money, if, if you're more familiar with that sort of terminology. Again, they had a standard as policy colleagues that they were ready to implement, and we helped sort of learning from the brownfield work. Um, said, actually, let us help you go through a digital design process to understand how best to, to factor that, to slim it down, and to do it in a more sort of um, appropriate way. So the consultation just finished on this. We had the consultation. There was a sort of section which was uh, through GitHub where people could comment on the standard itself, and you can still go along and have a look at that, even though formally that consultation is closed and we're awaiting the outcomes from that. But that was really nice to work in that sort of way with colleagues at that more fundamental data layer. And something that we're working on at the moment is local plans. So this is, uh, each council does a thing every five years or so that says these are the rules for which you apply for planning in this area, um, and uh, this is how many houses we're going to build, and those sorts of things. And again, we sort of hope to get, be able to draw out data from these largely sort of PDFs that are just sort of locked away uh, with lots of excellent work gone into them. Uh, we thought we'd be able to sort of expose that. Again, that's really, really hard, and so even things like the definitions that people were talking about for homes has obviously uh, varied quite a lot. So we're, we're hoping to do something in the shorter term that does start to expose what data we can find and, and help local authorities uh, help us correct that and iterate that. But in the longer term, again, we're going to have to go back to how do we actually bite off a chunk of the local plans, which are sort of enormous sort of entities in their own right, to try and uh, improve the, the core data quality. Another thing that my uh, team does is look at um, uh, how do we improve local councils' uh, digital capability and services. Uh, it's program Local Digital, we have a local digital fund. Uh, there's lots of really, ex I'm really excited about this, by this work uh, to collaborate with councils and trying to have uh, uh, repeatable uh, patterns and plans for services. And there's again a big appetite amongst councils to try and get out of their um, legacy technology which makes access to the data uh, harder again than it might otherwise be. So there's a data element of this as well as a, a um, core you know, user uh, focused and uh, council worker focused um, uh, improvement to their services. And we've been working with uh, my society actually more recently to look at can we, again, how do we get a uh, something like akin to a register of planning um, uh, data from, from the recent past, where there's huge interest from all different reasons to get access to this. We're looking at more simple things. Can we scrape it? Can we kind of be able to uh, purchase it in other ways? But actually, look, there's, again, there's this fundamental question about the, the, uh, the data quality. So we're at the early stages of discovery on this, uh, but I think it's a really interesting area of work and something we're hoping to take forward. Um, within the team, we, ha we certainly have the digital services work that Paul leads. We have, as I've mentioned, the work on local authority digital capability, which is such a critical part of this. But we also do, if you like, more classic policy work. So I mentioned the work around ordnance survey and geospatial uh, data. So we, the, again, there's sort of quite traditional policy work that goes on with colleagues across government to try and uh, make better decisions around that. And we're also uh, engaging with that sort of wider uh, uh, end users in the prop tech sector to see what their needs are, both from a data point of view, but also from a wider government support in something that's actually quite a weirdly fragile market. You would expect it to be perhaps uh, stronger than it is at this point in time. And then my last few seconds, I just wanted to essentially big up the point around um, if people have come across a one team gov uh, movement in and around uh, government, not just in the UK now, but internationally. It's so important, I think, this thing of we are not a transactional service department in CLG. When you do digital in CLG, you don't ever go to CLG to get, the, sorry, MHCLG, to, to, uh, to, get, to get a thing. You, don't, you, don't, get, you don't, don't go as a user, if you like, to go to the CLG and get, MHCLG and get a thing. We do policy work around you know, system stewardship. And so trying to improve data, it fundamentally requires a, a working across the data, the digital and the policy communities. We can't fix this data plumbing without our policy colleagues. So for me, bringing those worlds together has been such an important part of what I think we've been doing to date and what I hope to see so much more of within my department and across uh, Whitehall and local government uh, in the near future. And that's me. Don't know how close I was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yes. I should say, come and, uh, we do try and work in the open wherever we can in this work, so please do uh, pop in and uh, um, have a look at the work we've got ongoing, uh, much as it's a quite early stage, uh, but come and say hi digitally or in person if you'd like. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Questions? So we've got the gentleman over there. Any more? Again, we'll try to take them in a bank of three. Um, one of our fellow speakers at the front, and then just by the camera as well. And we'll take um, a fourth question from from lady there as well. Uh, Sam Smith, old foe of Paul's. With the spending round coming up, what's your biggest potential improvement using that available process? Uh, uh, hi, Sam. <laughs> um, so, well, spending review, uh, we, I suppose we may or may not be coming on, spending on what happens, I suppose. But um, uh, we are quite hopeful that there's some... Um, I think there's some quite significant possibilities on the local government side, both to improve the services that uh, individuals get when you go and interact with local government in terms of service design and digital service quality, but actually in terms of um, you know, breaking them away from that sort of legacy model that too many councils are sort of um, uh, still tied up with into a sort of more, more modern digital and technology approach. I think the opportunity there is quite a big improvement in cost saving and productivity. Uh, for, um, I mean, just looking at things like in planning uh, with some of the councils that we were working with, this sort of 50% uh, sort of uh, failure demand rate for people putting in planning applications. And then you've got highly paid planners then interacting with individuals to say you haven't submitted the right documents in the right order. And you're just like, this is taking up the call centre, it's taking up planning, and this shouldn't be a hard problem to fix. But in the current design and technology setup, it, it really is. So I hope that on the back of the work that we've been doing with, um, you know, uh, uh, we've got 16 projects live in the local digital space, and I hope on the back of that we'll be able to um, uh, uh, see more work in, the, in, in, in that space. I think it's, that for me is quite exciting, I think. There's a, if you think of the size of the digital possibility in central government, it's, I think, at least equivalent in, um, uh, in local government. So if we take the lady in the front row there, then the gentleman by the camera. Yeah, I didn't do your thing in order. That's Sorry, right. did I? It's okay. I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Uh, Louise Hutchinson from the Traffic Penalty Tribunal. Uh, we provide adjudication for people who receive parking and other traffic penalties. And it was interesting your point about local authorities. We actually managed to roll out a digital system to over 300 local authorities in a 12-month period. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether you're actually looking maybe outside of planning as well to look for other examples of what can be done easily in a web-based system. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, John McTernan from PSB Research. Um, you've got competing audiences with very different values. So voters and citizens and residents and councillors and planners and builders and developers and volume builders and SME small bit family builders. Mm -hmm. How do you decide between those competing priorities? Thanks. John Downing from Ofgem. Um, you're talking about using uh, lots of different uh, tools and techniques and common patterns. I wonder if there's specific tools that you promote specifically for using uh, geospatial data in government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, this is actually really hard, isn't it? Trying to remember and think and uh, uh, newfound respect for politicians. And um, uh, also on the other local digital services. So it's not. So we're obviously interested from um, MHCLG. Uh, on the housing and planning side, but there's a huge range of services in local government. Uh, the LGA say up to 900 services. I suppose it depends how you count them a little bit. So our work on local digital spans across that range. Um, and there's lots of, um, so there's 16 projects we funded. Again, if you go to localdigital.gov.uk, you can see the ones that we're working on. People are, are doing their sort of weekly show and tells uh, in the open and blogging about that stuff, so you can see. I think it's the tip of an iceberg, though. I think, you know, if you think about the main domains of local government, each of those uh, uh, need uh, help and support. And we're hoping that over time, this is going to be a longer term plan, but that ability to be able to not just ship one product, but to do that product, and then almost like productize the how you did it, and the, the templates on design and technology, and hopefully through into a, a sort of digital marketplace, will reduce the burden and the cost for others to be able to replicate that service. Adapting it to their own unique uh, needs in local government, this isn't a one size fits all, but there's lots of common elements that I think we can make, uh, which is, makes me so excited by it. Um, then, uh, uh, John's question, um, so lots of competing interests, it is interesting, isn't it? So. Um, at the moment, it feels like on the, taking the, the digital land uh, piece of work, 
you know, there are a number of common elements. If you start right at the sort of bottom layer, if you like, thinking about m core geospatial mapping and the, the identifiers that help link data together, well, actually, they're common whatever your, whatever your purpose in life. Uh, fundamentally, Ordnance Survey is there somewhere in the way if you're interested in sort of data about land. So that's an important thing to get right, and obviously people are working on that. I think you then sort of go up the layers. You think about like planning data. Again, um, whether you're interested in trying to expose for uh, citizen, um, uh, sort of enable citizens to be more vocal about what's happening with planning in their area. Um, you're still interested in the sort of history of planning, even if you were uh, uh, compared to, say, somebody who's thinking about, well, I've just built some triangle-shaped houses for students near a railway station. Where else in the country could I build something like that outside of the area that I grew up in? Um, you're still interested in those same sort of blocks of data. So you know that layer, the diagram is saying, you know, we're really interested in these fundamental blocks of data. They in turn feed services which feed decisions and information. I think in a way the choice has become more acute higher up that, that level that you're interested in. Nonetheless, the question of which, what do we go and fix next has largely to date been dictated by what is our department working on uh, where there seems to be something useful, where someone's willing to work with us and we can get some stuff done. Um, I think it's a good question for us to go as we interact particularly with external users and they're starting to say things like they're interested in um, data about rental prices. So from the land registry you get quite a lot about sales prices. There's very little data about rental prices but there might be some things that we do like deposit rental schemes that might uh, find a way into that. So we're trying to balance, well, okay, maybe we start new work in those areas that are not ones that are currently on the department's list. And I suspect the, the trade-offs will become more live to us as we, as we get further on. And, oh, John, I can't remember your question. Remind me, please. Common tools, Common tools about geospatial data. So, um, uh, well, there are lots of geospatial tools. I probably shouldn't stray into that. I suppose on the common patterns, what we're trying to do is say, as people... Um, uh, say whatever it is, say sort of residence parking service or something like that. As people start to uh, uh, design in local councils what that should look like, they're thinking about what, what their user research has found, what their workflow is, uh, what the design on the page works like and how they've iterated that, uh, what, the, uh, what the stack looked like underneath that. As people are starting to do that, there will be common elements. And it won't be exactly the same council to council, but we think there's a lot of appetite um, and possibility in taking some of the pain so you never have to take the legacy product that you've been using for 20 years, nor grow your own internal digital team from scratch, GDS-like, because most councils won't be able to do that. There's a, there's, a, there's a space in between where we can fill a gap to take some of the pain away, yet still create um, services that are modern and acceptable for everybody, but um, uh, you can still amend and adapt to your particular local needs. So that's the sort of more the, we're more thinking about it from the, from the, the core services within local government rather than the particular internet age tools that you might use to do particular tasks. So if I can chicken out of your question in that way, I'll, <laughs> I'll do that. Um, seconds. Does anybody have one very, very quickly? Um, we've got two there very, very quickly. Martin Pilkington from uh, RHU Global. Um, we have uh, 100 local authorities using our app, and we have 400 local authorities yeah. using our collaboration software. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a forum that companies like us and anyone else that yep. is here could engage with you because yep. we've got a lot of ideas about how we can use data so, and how we can uh, do into analytics. Yes. yes, absolutely. So we've been working with Tech UK, not just for members of Tech UK, but as a sort of convener, because we're, as, as, as you say, there's a big shift that's going on on the supply side. In many ways, it's not brand new, is it? We've been making this shift for, for a long time, and people in the local government have been working really hard to, to create this. It's not like just been invented here. We're kind of riding that wave. So uh, yes, Tech UK have been providing a forum that feeds in directly to us and has helped convene uh, all different types of suppliers in this market. So I would point you towards colleagues there. We've hit the zero bet. If we have a very quick question, a very quick answer. <laughs> How can we share the learning around data infrastructure across departments? Oh, that's a quick question. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, I th this is why I, I'm really glad that we've, we've got this event. And I think there's other ways in which we've met up more sort of informally. Uh, Open Data Camp is a, is a nice example that you're involved for many years, of course. Um, uh, I wonder if there's some sort of, like, who, who, who is the sort of convener in this space around data? Because it's not actually that clear to me um, really who is in government at, at the moment. So perhaps we just should organise it ourselves, if not. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And next up, from our very kind sponsors for the evening, from Vocalink, uh, we have David Divot.
Right, thank you very much. I'm going to use, I think, my eight minutes to talk mostly about relationships. But to get a better sense of what I mean by relationships and what kind of relationships I mean, it's a good idea for me to explain a little bit about who Vocalink is and what we've been doing for the last couple of years within the analytics department within Vocalink. Um, so uh, Vocalink is the operator of quite a few of the UK's payment systems. So faster payments, BAX, the Link ATM system checks. Um, so we, the data flows through our rails. It's not ours by default, it belongs to the banks, it belongs to the schemes, but we are the operators and therefore with the right permissions in place, we can start to look at that data and do interesting things with it. Uh, and this is the stuff I'll talk about today is some of the first, I guess, most interesting things that we've been looking at over the last couple of years. So we started a couple of years ago with the banks in the UK and the premise was, what can we do at a network level to tackle financial crime? How can we use the data and the relationships in that data to tackle financial crime? Um, and I know a few of the speakers have mentioned things like data quality, and I don't want to make you all jealous, but the data quality in our system is extremely, extremely good. And that's just, <laughs> it's by the nature of what, what we do, right? So we run payments, we run national critical infrastructure, which has to be perfect or things go very wrong. So yes, we have an extreme amount of data that um, runs through the systems, but it's the quality of that data that really lets us do some really amazing things. And when you're looking at financial crime in particular, data quality is key because the signals that differentiate a legitimate payment from uh, an illegitimate one can be extremely minor. And so small, different, small um, problems with the data can actually give you false signals. So what are we talking about? We're talking about lots of payments, payments to and from people, payments to and from businesses, um, flowing through our system. Some of them are very, very fast, like the faster payment system. Some of them are slower, like when you get paid your wages, they go over a slower system. Um, but it gives us lots of data to work with, lots of, um, lots of points to look at, and lots of really amazing relationships in that data. And that's what we've been working on. So imagine we start from a fraud or a scam and we build some algorithms that take that initial fraud, let's call it a seed, and we grow a tree from that seed. So the tree becomes the flow of those illicit funds as they move through a fast payment system like faster payments. Um, so the aim of this, and this is what we started a couple of years ago, was to figure out what kind of things can we uncover? Can we uncover networks of money launderers? How do they behave? What are the patterns in that data? Um, and it's an unfortunate part of this. The faster we let things move, the faster the criminals can move as well. And when that data disappears or when that money disappears from an account, from a victim, it's very, very difficult to get it back. And it gets used for a lot of pretty terrible things. Um, so that was the premise of, of the work we did, started on a couple of years ago. So. This is the type of thing that comes out of that. Um, I'll explain a little bit how you read this, just so you, you can understand. Each of the horizontal swim lanes are a bank account, a UK bank account. They're grouped by color by the bank. So you can see there's a couple in the top orange bank, four, five, four in the uh, blue bank, and one down here in the pink bank. Now, the top, the very left of these, these are our dispersion trees. The very left is a victim. They lost, in this case, 18,000 pounds to a scam or a fraud. So what we did then is mapped out what happened after that. And you can see right away, almost within minutes, they start taking the funds and firing them up to another account back in the originating bank, different account, but the same bank. And every one of those payments decreases by one pound. So it starts 985, 984, 983, and they're doing two or three payments a minute. So we're pretty sure this is scripted. It's probably not a human at the end of the, operate, uh, at the, end of the keyboard. Um, and then when they've exhausted almost all of the funds that went into this account, they split it up into three or four payments into three or four different accounts and get rid of it again. So they're hiding the source, they're obfuscating where, where it originated, and they're making it very difficult to trace that back. Um, let me flip to the next one because we'll run out of time very quickly here. Um, you may have all heard a little bit about this um, ongoing loom pyramid scam that's going on. We actually picked up on this quite a while ago, and this is what that looks like when you try to map um, the network of accounts. So this started with a 100 pound reported disputed transaction that we ran through the algorithm, and you can see it, it generated you know, 1,500 transactions at two or 300 different accounts. 
But what you can see clearly here is there are some accounts that get used over and over again. So what we do is we run this through our system and we alert the banks to all of these accounts that are, that are potential money mules within their system. Um, and then they can go ahead and investigate those and shut them down quicker than they would have been able to if you're just looking at the individual account activity. So we're using relationships to put these things together and to try to explain the risk in, in the system. This is a really interesting one we did as well. Um, <clears throat> any guesses for what it is, feel free to shout it out. But it, let me explain it to you. So this one looks at the relationships rather than the flow. So what we've got is a number of these yellow kind of sources of funds. They're feeding in through these pink um, transmitting accounts. They're going into the middle of this uh, little symbol, this little um, uh, motif in the middle. And he's paying out to all of the, the ones around it. So, We've got funneling of funds into the middle and then paying out. And when we looked at the transactions behind this, we saw this was a Bitcoin Ponzi scheme that was actually shut down in the US at some point. This was a UK branch of it. And so if you think about a Ponzi scheme, it's actually quite a, a perfect representation. You've got your first line um, investors getting paid out with the proceeds from the ones here, the second line. And this is the way we think visualizing the data is a really, really important way of Training and training your eye towards the most interesting patterns. If you were to try to pick that out from raw data itself, you end up essentially having to try to guess what is going on by numbers alone. And as soon as you visualize it, um, you get a much better view of that. We build this. This is part of a much, much larger um, visualization that we've done. We actually have an interactive visualization that we can. Um, zoom in and out of and we show essentially all of the money laundering activity in the UK um, And it's it's quite an interesting thing to look at. It's really interesting to see how it evolves over time as well um, and how if you basically start from the center of this um, of this pattern and step out three This is basically three generations from the center so you can see how incredibly complicated and organized and quick they uh, are able to transmit money the one thing that we're really, we see here is that it is organized. It is incredibly organized. And we can't kind of just assume that these are small loan actors working alone in a basement somewhere. Obviously, that happens. But the real stuff happens at a very organized level. It doesn't only happen in kind of money laundering or consumer to consumer fraud. We've done a lot of work looking at um, business fraud. This is kind of showing the risk to businesses of things like CEO and invoice re redirection fraud. It's a big problem and it's a really interesting problem because you can see the risk is actually very well distributed. It's not obvious. There's not pockets of things that are uh, that you know you could write a rule to detect. You really need to look at the data at a massive scale to uh, to detect this type of fraud. So. Final few seconds, I'd say that this type of approach and the algorithms we're using, it, we started with financial crime, but it's definitely not the, the only thing that can be used. We think we can use this data to trace other things. We think especially we could use the payments data to do things like economic intelligence and to help, to help in that area as well. So it's hopefully the first of many things that we get to do. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. So, do we have any questions? So we've got a question down the front here. Any more? Uh, we've got another question down the front here. Um, so let's start with those two questions. Jeremy Fisher from Offgem. Um, with the very pretty examples you've shown us, what were you, did you discover those by data mining, or were you provided with clues that allowed you to build your diagrams? I'll remember that. Okay. Uh, Louisa from the Data Science Campus. Um, what I really want to ask is, can I have your data? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wondered what other information, so you've got the flow, you know, how much is being um, transferred, and you know the business or the, the person, what else mm -hmm. do you know about the Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, so um, the very first thing we did when we built the initial algorithms, we were given these seeds, these confirmed frauds and scams from the banks, and they gave us tens of thousands of them. So we used those to start to build out the network. And the trick to all of this turned out not to be how do you follow the funds, but it's how do you stop following the funds. Because if you imagine, a lot of people in here 
are maybe paying bills, even if they are fraudsters, money launderers, they might be paying bills, they might, you know, it's very easy to network the entire UK. Mm -hmm. So the trick was actually starting from all of these um, frauds and scams, run some algorithms and then tune it based on, um, based on looking at the data and really mining the data to look at, okay, where does the long tail kind of get to a point where we'll cut it off here because we're at too much risk of, of networking everybody together. Um, so that was the beginning. What we're doing now that we're running it is we're looking at saying, well, now we're getting very good at figuring out what is a suspicious motif. You know, this thing here, that's suspicious. It doesn't happen in nature very often. So we're saying, well, we can start to look at the data as a whole and then pick these things out without having a seed to start from. So essentially looking at if we build everything and then pick out the pockets based on motif detection, as I like to say, then we can start to, to, to look at getting you know, closer and closer to, to being right up front in real time and predictive and, and all of that. So uh, yeah, this was the what else is available. So this is all um, built on transaction data. Transaction data in the payment space is relatively lean, um, especially account to account payments. Card payments have quite a bit more data, including <coughs> locations and, and that kind of thing, whereas we, we don't have that. So we have literally who it, was, um, who it came from, where did it go. Um, think about what you fill out when you, when you send a payment yourself. Um, so we, uh, so it's, it's actually quite a limited data set. We don't actually know if, um, if an account is a business or not. It's not part of the transaction. We do some inference in, as part of this, and the algorithm has some inference built in to, to decide, does it look like a business? What does it look like? What other things can we infer from the data? But in general, the data is pretty lean. <laughs> lean and clean. <laughs> of questions. So we've got one in the front here and then another one in the back there. Hi, my name is Mallory. I'm from the Prime Minister's Implementation Unit. Um, you've mentioned how you have helped inform banks in their own investigative processes and mm -hmm. preventing sort of further financial crime through using this. Have you looked at all at how you support police forces who struggle to investigate you know, complex financial crime or what that relationship might look like? Uh, yes. Is there another one? Or do you want to <coughs> yeah, related question actually. I wondered whether you'd had what successes you'd had and to what extent you'd found things that uh, other parties, such as financial investigators, were completely unaware of. Sure. Um, okay, yes. So law enforcement, I, we think, will play a key role in this. Um, because the data belongs to the banks, we've obviously started there, and that's been kind of let's build the base and let's build the foundation for something. We've definitely had a number of conversations with law enforcement who, um, you know, understandably would love to get involved, uh, especially because right now the approach tends to be, you know, if there's suspicious activity, it gets sent to, to the law enforcement for, for investigation, but there's no kind of overall analysis that puts it together or that helps them prioritize. And we're, we'd like to help them prioritize their investigations um, to say, you know, if you're investigating this count, versus this account, which one should you prioritize? Well, if we're looking at it as a whole, we can help you do that. So it's, it's not happening today, but we're, it's definitely one of the objectives that, that I'd like to see come of, come of this. Um, in terms of things that have been discovered, so uh, we don't find the outcome of all of these things because obviously there's some sensitive investigations that go on, but um, we do track kind of the number of accounts that get successfully shut down, and in particular, we're interested in the number of net new Mule accounts that we find, and there's been a significant number of net new accounts, even from the first <coughs> week of turning it on. There were new Mule accounts that were previously unknown that had been detected by, by, the, um, by the solution and then shut down. I think one of the really interesting things we found is that we might generate an alert on you know, a relatively normal looking account that the transaction on its own looks you know, benign. But when the banks do their own investigation and look at link analysis within their own data sets, so looking at you know, um, all of the other bits of information they see on an account that we don't, they have uncovered some very large rings attached to these accounts with 50, 60, 70 other mules attached to that one account. So it's almost like this kind of, uh, as people poke their head above the parapet to maybe get a bit of money, 
And normally that would go unnoticed, but this won't let that happen. And they'll pick up on that and do some further analysis and be able to actually detect the wider rings of activity that are happening. We've definitely got time for another set of questions, just under two minutes. Blimey, OK. Um, let's go for the two in this row to start with. We might get through another set if we're very lucky. We'll try to be quick. Um, I'm Ruth Ward from HM Treasury. Um, I'm just curious, you're talking a lot here about using this system to track financial crime, and obviously that's a really big and important issue. But whether you've looked at applying it to any other questions, um, uh, mapping transactions through the economy sounds quite similar to looking at mm. traffic on the road, say, and, and what Louisa was talking about earlier. So is there an economic indicator potential here? Sure. Hi, uh, Matthew Trimming. Uh, we know that the ONS is interested in your data. Um, are Not you, our data. Yeah, well, the bank's data. Uh, well, I'll be very clear. <laughs> data they don't have. <laughs> um, are you interested in um, public sector data sets that you'd like to get your hands on yeah, and, and why? Absolutely. Yeah, so the first question about um, uh, applying the technique to other things, absolutely, we'd love to do it. Um, we think this data set would be a, a really, really interesting one to apply to economic things. And, you know, we've done some internal um, studies looking at things like liquidity forecasting and that type of thing, but you can broaden that. If you imagine, um, you know, a, a very, very high proportion of the wage payments for the UK go through these systems. So you can get a very, very good and real-time um, indicator of what's going on. Um, in terms of, oh, other data sets, yes. I mean, my data science guys are always drooling for whatever data they can get their hands on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, but uh, yeah, so absolutely, we would love to marry some of these things together and see, and see what else we could do. It's looking for the right use case, I think. Excellent. Okay. I think we'd probably better leave that one there. But uh, David, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. And now, bringing our very first data bytes to an end, we're going to hear from Sophie and John from Ofgem. Hi, I'm Sophie Adams. I'm a product owner, and this is John Downing, a data scientist. We're both in the data services team within Ofgem. So I'm going to give you a very whistle-stop tour of the work that we're actually doing. Um, so welcome to our first slide. So we have been working on our technology, our infrastructure, as part of our really holistic picture of how we deal with data within the organization, how we deal with energy data. Um, so we've been building our data exchange and data hub. So we're looking at our end-to-end -end consumer, uh, end-to-end journey, our user experience, so how we get data into the organization, how we get it out of the data, uh, out of the organization and how we're dealing with it in our data hub. So cleaning it up, transforming it, what stats can we better utilize, not just for us, but across the industry. And we're doing this with a number of stakeholders, so we are engaging across different sectors as well, so not just for uh, data providers, it's network operators, we're working, looking at across the water sectors, the whole shebang. Um, and it's all well and good, we've got our infrastructure, we're working with externals, but actually what about the data governance, what about the policy, security, how are we engaging across the marketplace, so you've got the top right here, and we're starting to explore where are some commonalities across different utility sectors. Um, so to give you a bit of an um, overview of the actual data that we're dealing with, I'm going to hand over to John. Um, okay, so... Yeah, we don't really have time to go into kind of all the data that we're using, but um, we'd like to kind of talk to you about the um, technology that we're building. So this project was started two years ago, and we've got the data hub now established, and the data exchange is just about to go into private beta. Um, and these are kind of two key components that I think a lot of organizations have uh, or need, and Ofgem is actually you know, able to kind of share some of this technology and also share the process by which this transformation has happened. So we started two years ago really looking at data quality and have kind of moved on to changing the security landscape for um, uh, information in Ofgem and the energy sector, digital transformation and organizational transformation in Ofgem as well, and now kind of starting to push industry to exchange data better and Ofgem is in this unique place where you know, they're sitting in the heart of the energy sector and everyone's giving them data. Um, so how did we kind of 
start and go about doing this? Well, we've set up a process which is kind of along some of Paul's lines of thinking around a process for delivery. Um, and we split things out into kind of these five steps where, you know, it's not just about building a data pipeline, it's actually about defining, exploring, and understanding the user needs and, you know, who wants to, who needs this, this data and what's the output from the data. So I won't go through each one of these and we, we could talk about that later. I think I'll be short of time. Um, and with this process, we're also kind of trying to create a, a full picture of, um, of different uh, people who work on these di uh, digital projects. So right from user research uh, all the way through to kind of uh, data engineering and data QA. Um, and the GDS manual doesn't really talk so much about data. So a lot of these things we've had to kind of test and learn uh, and iterate on ourselves. Uh, and then kind of through to data science at the end. Uh, one thing I'd just like to highlight that's worked quite well for us is splitting uh, the role of a business analyst into um, someone who is a true business analyst and cares about business outcomes and someone who's more of a kind of data savvy business analyst um, who looks much more specifically at technology and process. Um, and so we kind of have had the the business analyst guys doing the, the define and then explore and really digging into the data. And those, a, business, a data business analyst is different from a data scientist in our view as well. So data science probably someone who does much more complex mathematical modeling. Um, we'll skip back to this slide. Um, and then lastly, in terms of kind of going around organizational transformation, you know, this is where we started two years ago. Um, and this is kind of our data architecture, so we go through a series of steps to kind of enrich data right the way through collecting it from someone, a data supplier, to publishing it. Um, and you can't just jump straight from having nothing to suddenly having a, a data platform and a data exchange. Um, so we've gone through the step of, you know, having some data management in the data hub um, and still kind of keeping Excel, you know, everyone loves Excel, it's very, very good. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, so we're kind of halfway here at the moment, so we're using these tools, Zeppelin, uh, BI tool, uh, ClickSense, we're still letting people do Excel, and then starting to add in these tools, uh, machine learning in Python uh, and PySpark, the data hub itself is a Hadoop platform, um, and the data exchange is a kind of Java application which pipes data into the, into the data hub. Um, so I'd say we're, we're kind of halfway between here and here at the moment. Uh, and there's a lot of organizational learning that needs to happen. Right. So if we go going back to the one. user needs, we've not done this in isolation. So we've done hundreds, we've gone out to hundreds of different bodies. So consumer, um, consumer insights, so looking at network operators, suppliers, um, other government departments. And we've helpfully I put some emojis on this. Uh, this is one of the better ones, and you can even still there's some really angry faces here, even when it comes to data collection, manipulation, there's um, teams set up with data providers that are just to send data to um, government bodies, so there's a lot of work to be done in there. Um, to start completing the user journey, what we've done is, well, John has run through actually that middle section of how we deal with the data, but actually we're developing a data exchange. All of this is actually designed to be portable, reusable, so it's open source coding. We plan to plant it into other regulators with a bit of tiny bit of rework. It's reusable, it's open. Um, so you, it's role based access, uh, so you can log in. So a supplier could log in, submit data, it's auditable, it's traceable, it will then land into our hub. <laughs> You'll get confirmation back of has it landed, has it been rejected, and then in the longer term, actually, how do you bring insights back through this and how do you start to share? not just the data, but the methodology, is it open, you know, is, it, is the entire pipeline accessible? And to round it off, the insights that we're actually looking at, so we're using Zeppelin here, this is domestic tariff data. So this is how much you are paying for your energy, this applies to everyone in this room. So actually, this is daily data, this took weeks to just like get this time series done if you were doing it in Excel, it's huge, it's a gigabyte of data a week and it trips over very quickly. But actually, we can just large volumes of data. It's complex. We can do a huge amount of manipulation, cleaning up, and it gives us so much more insight. And going into ClickSense, which we're also using, we've got some pretty charts. You can start to join data sets. You can start to pull in data 
from all different organisations, you can start to manipulate it in a way that we've just never had that capability before. And again, it's not just for the energy sector. <coughs> what we're looking at is how can we bring in water data? How can we bring in telecoms? Say, for example, you've got an another beast from the east storm coming over. Is it affecting um, water supply? Is it affecting your electricity? Are there problems with the gas mains? But actually, is the problem there that you've got a roadblock so no one can get to it and you've got a pocket there that are having issues? You can suddenly see those spikes in issues but just having that capability to draw all of that information together. So I think to take away is that we really want to share our learnings. If you want to come and throw data at us, please do. Um, but it's taken a huge amount of new skills to do this. This is not just throwing like policy analysts or more economists at this. These are the skills that we've been recruiting. So it's your data scientists, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's your data business analysts, it's the whole package. Thank you. Do we have any questions for our final eight-minute slot? Any questions? Uh, there, there, and let's start with those two to start with. Uh, hi, Matt from the Centre for Aging Better. Um, in energy, you've got things like Centrica Hive monitoring non-energy stuff, things like whether someone is, is running too many taps or heating. Um, and that is going to feed into the health sector. Things like, is that person unwell? Does that person need care? How do you reconcile safeguarding that person's privacy, their, their data security, with big open source data sets like that? Hi, Martin Pilkington from IHG Global. Do you do predictive work? So in other words, you can see the mix of renewable and non-renewable energy sources and prices, and you actually are able to look forward and see what the volume is like, where the gap is, and what the price of energy is likely to be in the future. So um, on the first question, so it's about vulnerability and how you're taking in consumer data. We're not quite there that with all that thinking because we just haven't got into ingesting all of that data. But we're looking at the governance around it. So actually, it might be useful to tap into some aggregated information. But what we're working with across industry, and we're particularly with the Energy Task Force at the moment, is actually what are the principles governing that? Governing that? We might not necessarily need to see all of that data on a large scale as a regulator. Yeah. Why do we need to know that? We need to make sure that industry are making sure that's open. So even if you manage to see in the energy industry they're struggling or if there's a disability there, can you join that information across? And it's also how, when you've got data sharing of that, it, you don't penalise someone across industries as well. You've got to be very careful with, if they're sharing data, it's like for the good of the consumer, but if they're sharing it in one area, so as, especially over government as well, when we start to join of all of these data sets, we've got to be very mindful that they, they might be a vulnerable person, so, or they might need a little assistance, so how do we go about it in the right way? So it's, it's on our roadmap, but we just haven't got there yet. I'd add as well that... Um Kind of that level of granularity, so tracking whether someone's got their tap on. You know, you could do it with a smart meter, but Ofgem isn't yeah. taking smart meter data just yeah. yet. So, um, and then always that it's the data creators. It's their, you know, it's your data. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily Ofgem's data just to take from you. So you you should have that control mm -hmm. of who who gets your data. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, predictive modeling. Uh, in short, yes. Um, Ofgem does do predictive modeling. Uh, we do not do it yet in the platform. Um, so there are some teams outside of the platform, but we'd hope that we could take everything into the platform and you know, do it at a much greater scale or, or speed. Any more questions? Oh, sorry, yes. Hi, I'm interested in the seven uh, data sharing powers that are in the Digital Economy Act of last year. Uh, certain of them relate to sharing data between regulators such as yourself and other parts of government. I'm just wondering if you uh, started using that power at all. Mm, no, I have to come back to you on that, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm the same. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hi, so I'm interested in the, in the users, the end users of your data and what you spit out rather than the users who are giving stuff to you. And I'm just interested in, 
in where you are in thinking about Excel as the, play, the way in which you kind of get the data out into the world. And I'm just saying that as someone who is a user of data who is not particularly technical. Mm -hmm. So if something doesn't come in Excel, I kind of can't use it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'd just be interested to know, is that something that you found in your kind of user research? Um, you know, or are you finding people who actually want to see want something in like Tableau, for example, that Ofsted does, which is like, why? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so at the moment, um, I'll pass over to John and his love yeah. of Excel. <laughs> um, his, uh, so internally, we're working towards like creating better insights using some of these tools and getting data into a machine readable format, whether that's CSV um, format. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, and what we're looking at is that how much data can we actually start to get out into the big wide world, sort of whether it is like our like minimum viable product is CSV and sort of see what else we want. Um, I don't know if you. Yeah, I think that you know you're not looking for data; you're looking for insights. So the end goal would be for Ofgem to open up some of their portals and say, "Hey, come look at this dashboard. Click the things you want, and maybe if you really want." The data take the Excel as well. Um, Do you want the data? Okay, so, and I think that would always be open in the same way ONS shares data too. Um, but I think the end goal is really for them to host a lot of data in a common platform and then give the right people the right mm -hmm. interfaces. Um, and that might be, you know, energy regulators checking the way that regulation is done or the, the way that regulation is created by Ofgem and doing some quality assurance on that regulation. Um, in a platform with Python or in Excel or however they like to play. I think all of this is why you've got everyone loving having a data hub and more insight and a visualization tool on top of that. But it's, it's again, still that middle step. Like it's then how do you bring all of that together? And yes, Excel is like the favorite tool. Everyone, like <laughs> even for our internal users, it's just what people are used to as well. So I think your next steps are looking at some of the bigger pictures. Um, how do you start to get all of these to interact? What is the next step with that? And that's just not, not quite there with all that thinking yet. So Excel makes the world go round. <laughs> A final set of questions. Uh, we've got a gentleman here, a gentleman here. Any others? We'll take a final one if anyone's got one. Okay, we'll go with those two. Um, hello, uh, I'm Tom Dolan. I'm also a product manager. I was interested in your splitting of the two BA roles, and I was wondering if that had been in any way effective at helping people understand what all of this stuff can actually do for them, which I think is still the big gap we're trying to get across. Yes. There's lots of cool things, but does anybody want them? Jeremy Fisher from Offgem, a plant. <laughs> um, how do you measure your return on investment, which is kind of related to the previous gentleman's question? Uh, I'll take the splitting of the roles. Um, I think talking to people in different levels helps them understand what the outcome is. Um, and often, you know, the BA, in terms of the high level, he, he or she can talk and say, well, this is the outcome of the business, and people understand that. And then at the next level down, I think sometimes people are quite lost. Um, and having someone who's got the capability to you know, empathize and talk around that, not, they don't necessarily have to be super technical, they're more kind of outward facing to the business. Um, and so having two people who talk at different levels, I think helps, and then you know who to ask the right questions to. But if, we, if our teams were a lot smaller, it would just be one person, I think. It's just mm -hmm. the fact that we have quite a large team, we can specialize. And on how we measure success and sort of our value. Um, so it's, it can be quite difficult to get a really tangible result from all of this. And what we've been looking at is what our selling point is. So, I mean, it's where we can look at where we've uh, actually invested within projects within the organization. How much have we actually started saving? I mean. There's a colossal amount of time. I mean, in some of the teams, there's like 80% on just trying to find the data and manipulate it and clean it up. However, all of this automates that entire process. It removes the entire human interaction from when we get the data in to the end results sort of spitting out into the BI tool. It, now, it allows people to spend all of their time gaining inside. So we measure our success of like how many users are we onboarding, how many data sets are we getting through. Not only that, it's 
I mean, we've saved a couple of million already in the last six months from stopping people out going out to other consultancies to do the same work that we could have run through the platform and that we have run through the platform and just actually creating that better insight. And those are some really huge wins. Those are our selling points. And this is what I'm trying to drive across is that actually, can we get data from other sectors? Can we actually show use cases where we can mash data together and just say, actually, we can do better for the consumer? Or where can we add value? Or what can we stop doing, more importantly? Thank you very much. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I hope you did too. Um, for very different projects and presentations, but some interesting common themes. People wanting to throw their data at one another, for a start. <laughs> um, but genuinely questions about sharing and access. Lots about fixing the plumbing, getting the infrastructure right. The importance of good data visualisation, which we're also big fans of here at the Institute. But also thinking about the real world impact of everything that we've just seen. Thank you very much indeed for coming to this first of our Data Bytes events. As I said, the next one will be on the 1st of May. Do come along. If you'd like to present, do talk to me. If you'd like to give us some money to keep the series going, uh, please do talk to my colleague, David. And all that remains for me to say is join us outside for some drinks and nibbles. Thank you again to Vocalink for supporting tonight's event. Thank you very much to you all for coming. And a huge thank you to all of our wonderful presenters this evening. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs>